we're going to go on and discuss a topic that uh, is going to build on the ideas of that we're, we were exploring in kind of a, a very, very basic way with hidden Markov models. But uh, there we were exploring discrete time, discrete state systems, non-outbreak, outbreak, time week by week by week by week. And with particle filtering, we're going to, as with Kalman filtering, and as we will do with particle MCMC, we'll be applying these techniques to systems that are in continuous time and that are in, have continuous state space. You can have more infectives or fewer infectives, more susceptibles or fewer susceptibles, et cetera. But observations, as with hidden Markov models, will still be at discrete time points within that continuous time span. Okay, now particle filtering is a topic that um, is very current, um, very effective, feasible, powerful, demonstrated, um, and it's used in a routine way. Um, some here may know that since the opening months of the pandemic, we've been using particle filtering on a day-to-day -day basis to provide advice all across Canada for, um, for uh, COVID-19 um, estimates and to project forward. Um, it's used day-to-day -day for our, our local health system. Um, it's routinized in, a, in an ongoing process. Um, and uh, it can be scaled at industrial levels. Um, and uh, we're gonna be exploring this and situating it within this landscape of techniques um, used uh, in this challenge of filtering. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, this course has within recent weeks talked about two rather different enterprises. Um, one, machine learning techniques, computational statistics techniques that seek to perform parameter inference. They try to infer the values of parameters, static parameters. Try to ask, what was the value of this static parameter that gave rise to this data we see from the world? A key problem, a key need a ubiquitous need, particularly in a world where often we don't have privileged access to parameter values. We may have evidence on some, but typically we don't on others. And we have to infer parameter values. And whether it was the very basic and ubiquitous technique of calibration or the successively stronger techniques of approximate Bayesian computation and MCMC, we had ways of trying to to assess plausible parameter values, whether it's privileging one single one that seemed to give the best match or drawing from alternative ones according to formal likelihood functions and priors that jointly produce posterior distributions. That was one big problem. The problem we're exploring today is of a different character. It's latent state inference. Um, often we will still have a need for parameter variation, but we won't be dealing with it, or excuse me, parameter estimation, but we won't be dealing with it directly for static parameters with these two techniques. We're going to be instead perhaps calibrating these techniques with different values of parameters, something we've very successfully done in some of our applications. Um, so it is possible to calibrate a common filtering or calibrate a particle filtering to try to find the parameter that best allows the particle filtering to, to match the data of the common filtering. Um, but we're gonna be focusing on these techniques by themselves, which don't try to estimate static parameter values, common filtering and particle filtering. Um, these are filtering techniques whose job it is, is to estimate the underlying state of a stochastic system. 
given that the system is knocking about and is, uh, is, is evolving in, in some ways that include randomness, specifying the parameter values isn't going to tell us what the underlying situation is. If it's moving around in uncertain ways, we need something more than that to, to estimate the uncertain situation. And you know the, the context I gave you last time, and I'm not going to repeat this, um, but I just want to remind you of it is, you know, for infectious diseases, a topic which brings us together here is that, you know, we constantly have new data coming in. We have models that we built uh, a long time ago, but which are becoming increasingly outdated over time. Their depiction of the initial state of the system is becoming outdated. Um, changes are occurring and behavior, changes in, in availability of therapeutics, uh, changes in risk perception and and changes in care-seeking behavior because hospitals are full, et cetera. And, and uh, when we build a model, we need to keep it current with that. And traditionally, with things like calibration, that's a, a fairly heavyweight process. And we're looking for a way to, to keep the model here um, always updated. The two reflections I asked, I led you on in the lead up to common filtering were, well, look, even the most, you know, the very best model built with the most informed data, the most astute modelers will eventually diverge in the empirical situation. Models are not crystal balls and they can be grievously misused and underappreciated if they're treated as crystal balls. And one of the reasons for this is stochastics. Um, the system inevitably has many factors we can't precisely anticipate, whether it's the weather, the vagaries of the weather that cause for those couple snowbound days, people to come in for testing a lot less, and we don't want to interpret that as a drop in incidence, or whether it's factors having to do with, you know, a, um, a misperception of the situation based on some social media posts or, or um, the stochastics of who happened to got infected at, at a holiday party. Um, there's a lot of stochastics affecting our system. And that leads even the best, most, the calibrated models that are calibrated in the most you know, powerful way given the data available will eventually diverge from the data. There's just a lot of vagaries and it would be a fool's errand as much as you, know, you can have the best hydrological model in the world and you're not gonna predict the exact timing of when the waves are cresting and, and at their nadir in a uh, in a in the ocean or in a river, uh, it's in the nature of things that models are not going to point predict the exact timing of outbreaks um, after they're calibrated. It's a fool's errand um, to expect uh, a model once built will somehow magically tell you exactly when exactly the outbreak is going to occur. Um, and so, what we're trying to produce here is frequently regrounded models that can be built quickly, but can be kept current, can be kept regrounded with data, always fresh, and where we're estimating the current situation so we can look forward. We're trying to move beyond blindfolded models to models that have their eyes wide open. And I used the example last time of trying to get to your office. You have an excellent model, but you never try to do it with, with a blindfold on. You'd end up flat on your back, and uh, possibly you know, seriously injured or killed because you're not using your eyes to complement the model. We wanna give our models eyes. We want our models to be able to be clued into what the situation is so we can look forward. And the example I gave also was of a weather map, right? Um, we, we depend on some of the world's best weather models to guide whether or not we should drive from one city to another tomorrow or whether the road conditions will, will uh, be too dangerous. But once again, it would be crazy if we were using those same models um, whose last refresh of data was you know, beginning of March. Uh, it, would be, be, it would be nuts because the model may be the best model in the world, but all sorts of things have transpired since the beginning of March. And if the model doesn't know about them and it's trying to predict the weather to, tomorrow based on what it knew at the beginning of March, it's bound to be off. Um, how could it not be, right? Um, so we, we look for our models to be kept always updated. And, and 
Um, uh, and you know, we're, we're looking for our models to be updated about the current situation because we always want to give our policymakers and our planners, those triggering, who want to trigger surge capacity, those who want to trigger, um, you know, extra resources for, uh, for, for patient care in the ICU or in the ED or what have you, we want to give them proper lead time. We want to be able to anticipate what's coming and we want to be able to ask what if questions, which actually represent the real situation. So, you know, in terms of lead time, we'd like our model, instead of be becoming increasingly disconnected from what's going on, like a weather, a weather model that hasn't been updated for weeks about, about the, uh, the weather, we'd like it, I'd like to be able to always reground a model. So we can ask, hey, what's, what's likely to be coming up in the next week, given where we're at, just like we do for a weather model. And whether we're, no pun intended, between uh, outbreaks, and we want to look and, and get that whispering of the coming outbreak, um, or whether we're at the early stage of outbreak, and we want to know, you know how quickly it's likely to rise and, and um, when it will is likely to abate, exhaust a set of susceptibles, or whether we're at the peak of an outbreak. And we wanna say, hey, how long is this gonna last? And when will it drop? And how quickly will the cases likely drop? We want that guidance. And we want guidance for our what if questions too. We wanna we want be able to ask, how we, should we best get to our destination of a low number of cases or a protected population? Um, um, to minimum number of, of ICU cases or to stay within those ICU capacity limits or hospital capacity limits, what can we best do to, to get there in light of the latest situation, in light of the latest epidemiology? Because the underlying situation matters for intervention trade-offs. If there's a lot more susceptibles that are here right now, we might want to put a lot and lot of effort into making sure that we have preventive measures in place that will protect them. If what we're dealing with is a lot of people have already been infected, we have to rev up that, that surge capacity, maybe bring some of those nurses who have been out there in the community uh, testing and, and, and get them in to, to, man, uh, to, to handle the ICU for the, for the next few weeks. Bad example, but... The idea is that the underlying situation matters in terms of intervention trade-offs. It often matters a lot which intervention is best in the next little bit what the underlying situation is. So all of these were motivations for Kalman filtering. And, and you could be excused for saying, well, yeah, so um, those are the, those were the, the motivations for Kalman filtering. What's, what's the deal of this fancy dancy particle filtering? Well, um, these two are close cousins. I kind of think of particle filtering as the 21st century equivalent to the Kalman filtering that was formulated in the 1950s and 60s, the middle of, of the last century. Um, Kalman filtering is great. It's um, very powerful. And a model that's Kalman filtered is so much better than a model that's not provided that assistance at all. But I want to remind you what Kalman filtering uh, gave us and what it didn't give us. Kalman filtering gave us maximum likelihood point and covariance estimates for the current state of the system. So it was estimating the underlying state of the system. You'll remember that. But it was doing so um, estimating what's the current, the current best guess of system state. That was that X hat that, with which we were dealing. And that was always being estimated. And then there was some covariance, this matrix P around that, that measured how uncertain we are about that point estimate along different directions of, of state. You know, um, maybe we're really confident about the number of uh, infectives right now uh, and the number of recoveds. Um, in an SEIR model, but not so much about the number of, of exposed individuals, for example. And so that covariance component might have a, have a large variance associated with our estimate at the number that are, that are exposed. 
So that's what common filtering gave us. Um, but it did so within some pretty tight assumptions. One of them was that um, uh, we had distributional assumptions that were rather tight, um, normal distributions. It's, it's odd. I had done a, a modification of this slide in some detail, and I'm not sure where it is. But um, uh, we, had, we had assumptions that the process noise, the stochastics in the system that were buffeting it about, that were leading to sometimes more infectives than we anticipated, or sometimes fewer, or what have you, that those were normally distributed. And we also had to assume to, to, to adhere to the Kalman paradigm, we had to assume measurement error. Our, our measurements um, of the number of people that are infected or or that were infected in the last week is it's off by a by an error amount that's drawn from a normal distribution that's Gaussian distributed as we say in engineering um, with the normal distribution having a, a Gaussian shape um, uh, but we also had to assume that the the nonlinear model could be linearized as could the observation function um, and if I had better presence of mind I would you know, trot out those um, those uh, equations there. In fact, um, I think you'll uh, excuse me if I just point to exactly where those uh, came in. Well, here were our assumptions of normality that these were identically distributed, and normally normally um, drawn from a normal distribution, and they were each draw from it was uh, was identically distributed is drawn from the same distribution and independent That's the front eye. Um, and then we have to be able to, to linearize the observation function and the state evolution function, this F. So we had to be able to differentiate it. Now, for many models and for most ODE models, that's not a problem. Um, neither of these are a problem. If we wanna think about agent-based models, um, or we want to think about um, models which might have a different form to them, which might not be um, uh, quite quite a simple a, uh, a function here. Maybe it's a non-analytic function or what have you. Um, we might run into trouble here, and so for for some context, that's uh, that's an issue. Um, uh, common filtering was designed with an eye towards engineering applications. Um, so it was in the Apollo computers, it's in uh, airplanes, it's in our smartphones to update us where we are moment, you know, minute, second to second it, uh, as, we, as we walk down a street and try to navigate to find the Metro stop or a friend's house. Um, it, it's in rockets, <laughs> but it's, um, it's designed for really quick turnaround, like for estimating the state every few seconds. And for most public health streams, we, we don't have data coming in that quick. Maybe it's once a day or a couple of times a day. And this tends to be very comp, you know, computationally frugal to the point of being needlessly so, leading us kind of um, doing the update so quickly that we end up just waiting for the, net, for the next data. Uh, was there a question there? I heard some, uh, some sound and I'm glad to answer a question. Um, Dr. Osgood, um, I have a quick question. I'm just yeah. um, trying, that's why I was asking for a um, code example, because I'm trying to separate myself from the heavy math behind this approach to understand yeah. the practical application. What, what I'm struggling here to understand is, mm -hmm. okay, from the basic way that you're explaining this is pretty straightforward. You have a predictive model like SIR, mm -hmm. yep. and then you have observed data coming in, like number yep. of cases, right? Yep, that's right. So, you just want to say today I have a number hundred people infected. I and my model says 150. I yep. based on the error that I'm introducing these two, I want to adjust my prediction yep. for what's going to happen tomorrow. This is the core concept of filtering, That's right? Concept. If I'm, That's yes. So what I'm struggling here to understand is my if I now want to predict what's happened in four months from now mm -hmm. based on this predictive model that I have, mm -hmm. I don't want to wait to receive these no. daily updates. No. I no. just want to adjust them out. What I'm doing next, am I 
plugging in these estimates in my model. Yeah, because so, we're not updating the parameters; we're just updating correct. the states. Correct. So, so, um, so you've been running the model with common filtering, particle filtering, PM, CMC, whatever, any of these techniques. You've been running it along here as data comes in, and that's updating your sense of the state estimate, um, and uh, all along. And this is where you are in time. Okay, mm -hmm. imagine this this uh, red bar. And what you want to do is to take that and run it forward. Um, not, I mean, this is the future. You, you don't have data from the future by definition, right? So you yeah. want to be able to run that model forward. And that's exactly what all three of these approaches give you the ability to do. And uh, what they would do here is for the common filtering, since your, your question also involved that, so this is the, the estimate update for the, um, for the point estimate, right? This is just where you said, we kind of look what data we got from the world uh, and we subtract off what we expected to get given our state. And we use that to adjust our state estimate, right? And it's, it's balanced in a way that takes into account the, the error in, in, our, in our, our estimated error from the model and our estimated error from the measurement, okay. So now that we've arrived at that, um, if you have no more data, if this is the final data point, um, you can just run this thing forward. You'll have no more data coming in. So the, the model will be governed by these equations. This is system evolution between measurements. So uh, you recall that the way in which it worked, it went back and forth with the common filter. And it's to be the same thing with particle filtering and within PMCMC, um, as well. It's going back and forth between a situation where you're just running the system um, in, a, in a standard way. This is true for all three of those mechanisms. It will, you'll just run it as if it were a normal model here. Um, these are the normal governing equations for your normal model, for your standard model. When I say normal, I don't mean normally distributed. I mean, typical model. Um, and uh, if this is only hit when you have data coming in. So if you have no data going forward, you're just going to be running this. Now, what, what is going to be happening in all of these techniques, inevitably, because it's a basic feature of our existence, is that our uncertainty about the situation will be growing, right? I, I gave the example last time of you walking to your office, um, you know, peeking out, um, every 30 seconds as to where you are, and that's going to allow you to correct yourself. Now, if you suddenly had no more data coming in, you know, um, your eyes uh, cannot be opened anymore, or it's pitch blackout or what have you, the longer you go on, the more and more uncertain you're going to be, the more uncertainty will accumulate around you, right? You're, you're going to be more uncertain because you have no reference, you have no sense. And so you're going to be more and more uncertain. And that's exactly what happens with these techniques, whether it's common filtering, particle filtering, or particle MCMC. They're running forward, and you're getting some sense in the near future of probably what's likely to happen. But the longer you go on, the more and more uncertain you're going to be. And you know, if you're out here years from now for measles, you, um, you're going to be, so this is like 10 years here, um, uh, here, it's about 10 years out from, um, from the beginning. And so this would be, you know, somewhere like uh, seven years out from, from this point, um, you're going to be more and more uncertain. And, and that's the nature of things. But the basic deal is that you are running this model forward as, as if there's no, no more data coming in, but you know, you just run it without that data going forward. I don't know if that's helpful. Uh -huh. Yes. So I don't want to hijack the class, but for example, if I was expecting to have 120 tomorrow case mm -hmm. of infection yep. and by, with common filter, yep. I need to adjust it to 95. I just need to plug in that 95 in the model and let the model continue, yep. right? Yep. That's right. You, so, you, so if I'm mm -hmm. reading data on death and cases, so yep. I have two different states, yep. right? Yep. Do I need to then enforce mass balance across the system? Because these are all connected. I can't just like plug Correct. random numbers in. Well, remember, so, so that's a very good question. And this is exactly what job is being undertaken by the model. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, 
when we observe data from the world, um, uh, you know, we're looking for a consistent understanding of what um, uh, what is the underlying state of the system, right? We, we need we need a, a description of what that data is telling us that that is logically consistent. Um, and um, it would be logically inconsistent if we said that data, you know, suppose we have a city of 100,000 people and we do some measurements. And if we said, well, the data is telling us that there are, you know, of these 100,000 people, there are 90,000 people susceptible and there are, you know, 100,000 people infected, we'd say that doesn't make sense. I mean, that, that there's a conservation of people. I mean, you, you, you know, you only have 100,000 people in total. Um, we, if, if we have 90,000 susceptibles, the total of infectives and recoveds can only be, you know, 10,000 um, to make up the, the balance of the 100,000. Um, in other words, it, there needs to be logical consistency. There needs to be that conservation of people that, um, uh, and, and that's exactly what the model gives us. So what we're estimating here uh, in terms of the state estimate will always uh, adhere to, the, um, to, to what is possible within the model. This is gonna be most obvious in Kalman filtering and particle MCMC, but it's actually enforced by the matrix algebra here as well. So when we are doing this state update, for example, um, what comes out of this, if, if you kind of by induction, if you say this was a legitimate state update uh, or, or a legitimate state estimate, you know, that it sums up to the total size of the population. And then you adjust it by this gain matrix times this difference, you will get something that is itself a legitimate state update because S plus I plus R, S so equal the total population or what have you. So, so that is guaranteed by the matrix algebra involved. And okay. it will be very obvious why that's guaranteed for particle filtering and particle MCMC. You won't have to kind of squint your eyes at the matrix algebra. I hope that's helpful. That's very helpful, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's why we're, and, and, and this bears emphasis, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stop my screen sharing and maybe just just direct my comments to you um, face to face. So um, this is a really deep philosophical point. Um, here, we're taking into account the observations from the world in a way that needs to accord with, needs to be consistent with our theory about the world. Where is that theory captured? It's captured in a model. And the model captures the regularities of say how COVID develops, right? You know, it, it goes through a phase where you're infected early on, um, but you're not infective for the first day or two. And then you develop a pre-symptomatic phase where you don't yet have symptoms, um, but you're infective, um, you're, you're in your latent state. And then you either have an, uh, an a, a largely asymptomatic form, we call it oligo or, or pausy-symptomatic form, or, or you have a frankly symptomatic form and that goes through an early stage where symptoms are inevitably mild. And then a, a, a later stage where symptoms can stay mild for most people, but sometimes become severe and even critical. Um, it may bring you to hospital. All this is captured in a mall. That's the kind of the theory of the underlying system. And when we have that, we want to be able to interpret data from the world, observations from the world in a way that is consistent, that is consistent with that theory. So that it, it jobs, you know, it, it, uh, it makes sense. Um, it is um, a sensible interpretation of the world. Um, we're not assuming that somehow magically people who were, you know, uh, recovered become, you know, uh, exposed again and, and develop infection. Or we're not assuming that someone who's purely asymptomatic is going to go into the hospital. No, no, no. We're, we want to interpret data from the world in a way that is uh, in line with our understanding of the regularities of how this disease behaves. And this is one of the problems of data by itself taken in isolation is, 
you know, we're, we want to interpret it. And, and our policymakers um, and, and many of the people on this call, you know, here um, probably have all had this problem of, of seeing new data, but we're always need to, and, and if you look at that data by itself, it's not, you're not clear what it's telling you, um, but it tells you a much clearer picture uh, of, of about what's going on in the world. If you have to make it align with our understanding of how, how you know, uh, COVID develops or how TB develops or how, you know, uh, uh, West Nile infection works or what have you. And that's what these models do with data. They're interpreting things from the world, wastewater estimates, number of cases, number of hospitalizations, number of deaths, in a way that fits the regularities that we have established scientifically about how, how infections proceed, how they're transmitted, et cetera. Who can transmit, who cannot, say at, at, at a, a very early exposed stage. And it all has to fit together. That's what our models guarantee. And that gives us a much clearer picture of why we see all this different data. Because all that data by itself it's a welter of, it's a cacophony of different numbers and, and values that full of sound and fury, but signifies very little. But if we, if we combine it with a model, it gives us this kind of consistent picture that is at once consistent with that, those regularities in the world, but also really constrains the possible interpretations of this data in the world. It tells us there's only so many ways that we could explain this data. What it's really telling us is probably it's one of these possibilities. And, and that is true uh, per Amir's question for all of these techniques. Common filtering will, gain, will, will ensure it. Particle filtering will ensure it. Particle MCMC will ensure it. All of them call upon for an interpretation of the data that has to be consistent with what can be produced by this model. Okay. Um, any any further questions about that? One more quick question, Dr. Osgood, sure. and that's we never talked about how we quantify the error around the observed data. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm looking at the uh, reported cases of illness by John Hopkins University on a daily basis right. in the United States, what's the error there and how can we quantify it? Right. Because that's um, a part of the process. Indeed. Indeed. So um, uh, this... Uh, what you're asking about is, is trying to get a sense of the, the amount of error associated with a given measurement. So maybe it's, maybe we have a couple of measurements, maybe we have hospitalization measurements, maybe we have measurements associated with um, uh, the underlying prevalence of infection, uh, maybe, maybe from um, test positivity um, or from seroprevalence uh, estimates, and maybe um, the number of, of reported cases. Well, um, uh, here we're going to be, we, we can approach this in a couple of ways. One way is we could ask, okay, um, uh, what do we know about the, um, the gaps and, um, and oversights and delays, et cetera, in this process? Uh, for example, uh, when we get data from health authorities, as we do on a daily basis for, for reporting with these methods, um, uh, what we'll often find is like the estimate for a given day, say today, um, um, you might think that you know, tomorrow's data will give us a new pet of, set of data, but the, the estimates, the, the reported data for today will, be, will stay the same. And that's far from the case. Actually, the data from today gets um, gets modified post hoc. In other words, it gets updated. Um, and, and they can go readily 10, 10, to, 10 days to, to two weeks back in time and be modifying values because corrections, new data with, that was delayed finally gets through and gets entered into the system or you know, a misclassification. So one thing we look at is kind of data change that occurs. And that provides kind of a lower bound on estimate. It, doesn't, it, it actually doesn't tell you how different the data is from the underlying situation that you're measuring, you're trying to measure with that, but it does tell you something about at least there's this much error 
um, that occurs in it. Another thing that you can look at though is, is asking, okay, um, uh, are there cases where we know that a more detailed study has been done and how far off are the estimates? Case in point, we do have seroprevalence estimates for, for some regions uh, that have been regions that have been performed with seroprevalence studies. And we can compare them with test positivity for those, um, for those regions. Um, and, and that will give you some idea. The goal here is not perfection. It's not to have a perfect sense, but to know which of those error estimates that are, which um, for Coleman filtering estimated the, um, you know, the, the covariance in the measurements, um, which, which, you know, which of its entries tend to be much larger and much smaller. This is a Bayesian approach. So you're going to be trying to, you know, give a, um, a, an, an interpretation of it that reflects your uncertainty about it. So it's, it's not, you know, the true error that's in the process, but it's the degree of uncertainty. And what you're generally going to hope for is something that will give you the rough bounds of that uncertainty. Hospitalization numbers, um, you know, um, other than delayed reporting for a day or two, the error in those are, are probably going to be pretty small because hospitals have an important job to do, which is to keep track of the people, number of people in the hospital and to deliver them services. Uh, by contrast, something like um, test positivity, um, you know, there, if you're using that in the model to estimate prevalence of infection, that could be highly variable due to who happens to come in today and, um, and you know, get tested, et cetera. So that might be associated with a much larger estimate. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's not going to be something where we're going to immediately know what is the true one. You can ask yourself, you know, as a Gedanken experiment, a thought experiment, if I were to run this again and again, if, if I could rerun the same day, how, how variable would that number be that I get for cases, um, uh, for example? Um, if, if you're using that to, to estimate reported cases, how variable is it? Um, and it might give you some rough sense as to the covariance, the, the variance expected of that particular measurement, and maybe something about its covariance with others. That's not a very satisfactory answer, but you have to recognize um, we don't, you know, we can't let great be the enemy of good here. And the technique is, is basically to give some relative sense of uncertainty. It's great if we can be more quantitative than that, like look at measurements you know, in a short period of time and see how variable there are where we think it's pretty much the same situation. If they're really varying a lot day to day, use that, that variance to estimate that entry in the R. Um, that would be you know, a nice way to, to try to estimate how variable it is day to day. Um, uh, given the same basic underlying situation. I've thrown out a couple ideas there, but you know, ultimately you are trying to char characterize your uncertainty rather than the true covariance of the underlying system, underlying measurements. Hope that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, um, and just remember that whatever you arrive at, it's probably better than assuming no error, you know, which is a lot of the times which, uh, you know, some techniques might, or not considering error at all, not considering any correction to the estimates at all. Practical hurdle. Recent surveillance um, reporting on COVID-19 suggested uh, uh, the most recently reported case counts for spotty. Oh yeah, absolutely. Will be a reasonable way to include that data to inform the states the model when we are updating it daily. Um, um, yeah, so, so this is the, the whole point I was making about outdated data and that it gets updated later. Um, our Particle filtering models actually do take exactly that into account. And uh, we do so um, in a way I, I don't have time to describe, but um, uh, it, it does take into account exactly this um, need to sort of recognize that, um, that data from today will be modified 10 days from now, two, day, two weeks from now, potentially, uh, retroactively. Um, and there's two ways you want to uh, two ways you want to approach that, I think. One is you need a, a way of um, taking into account in your 
If you're using Kalman filter in your error estimates or your likelihood functions for particle filter and particle MCMC, on the one hand. The other thing you wanna do is you wanna have a model architecture for reporting on an ongoing basis that kind of can go back up and, and run forward um, with the updated data um, uh, in light of the updated data. And we do both of those techniques. Um, so we, we sort of, when, we, when we're gonna project forward or when we get new data in, um, it's not, we don't just treat the new data point, take it in, say, thank you very much and run forward for a day. We're actually going back two weeks using all the data because any of that is, is fair game for modification and we run it forward. Um, and from there um, to interpret, it's as if we consider the most recent two weeks of data, including you know 13 days in the past as being the new data we're getting. And we run it forward. And then tomorrow we'll, we'll go and, and run forward from a bit of a later time, but, but still in the past uh, from now's perspective. Hope that's helpful. I'm glad to answer further questions about this in, in, our, uh, in our office hours. But let's get back to, uh, these were great questions and I'm so grateful for people bringing them up here. Um, so, so what we're doing is we are seeking to learn from this data earlier and, um, and use it to estimate our state, changing, changing parameters, and then be able to run forward, recognizing we'll get increasingly uncertain as, as time goes on. Um, okay, so I'd like to um, get back to this issue of common filtering. So common filtering is a great technique, um, it, but uh, it's, it's limited by strong distributional assumptions, assumptions of linearization, it, it's frugal, but so much so that maybe needlessly so. Now, a difference that I want you to recognize here is um, in common filtering, what we're fundamentally updating is our state estimate. I mean, it's, it's right here in front of us. We take our old state estimate and we take this residual and through this gain matrix, we update our old state estimate to become our new state estimate. It's the, the matrix math requires some thinking, but it's basically a process by which you're updating your, your point estimate uh, of the system and you're updating your estimate of the covariance. That's how common filtering works. Um, uh, and that will be in contrast to particle filtering. So in particle filtering, we, we're, we're, getting, we're getting at the same basic problem but we're pursuing it in a way that is more computationally rich, more general, and, uh, and more versatile. Uh, but it's also different in, in terms of um, what we update. So with particle filtering, uh, which is a sequential Monte Carlo uh, approach, SMC, um, here we're um, computing formally a posterior distribution over the states at a point in time. This is a joint posterior distribution over the states. So we're, we're computing the probability of being in a certain state over all the time till now uh, in light of the data and in light of the model and, and parameter values. So this is a joint distribution over the state. We're actually sampling from it. We're or drawing from it over time, okay? Um, in contrast to common filtering, which assumes normally distributed noise um, in measurements and process error, for particle filtering, we have very flexible distributional assumption. We don't have to, we don't have to um, assume any sort of normality or, and indeed any sort of, um, uh, parametric distribution. We could, we, we can have uh, an arbitrary distribution here. Um, uh, and that's going to uh, be quite liberating um, in terms of uh, our ability to, um, to, to handle much broader set of different situations. There's no differentiability or, or linearization that's required. We don't need to compute those Jacobian matrices that 
you know, that occupied us uh, down down here or 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 here. There's no need to to do that. Um, it's it's not in the cards. It's not a technique that relies on linearization around a point. Uh, far from it. We're or computing the, the posterior distribution. Um, uh, and uh, computations here are, are uh, more heavyweight than for common filtering. We're not gonna be updating every few seconds, um, but they're readily supported by existing computers and architectures. Um, now, a, a key difference though is, is between how these update. I said that common filtering updates the state estimate like this. It goes from an earlier state estimate and gives you a new state estimate. It updates the, the best guess as to what the state is. And it turns out that common filtering doesn't directly update any belief about the state per any micro belief about the state. What it updates is the balance of credibility. The the degree to which you believe one interpretation versus another. That is, of course, updating an estimate, but you're not updating the state of that estimate. What you're updating is the plausibility, your understanding of the plausibility of this estimate versus that one versus that one. You're updating the weights associated with samples that are called particles. Um, you're, you're putting more trust in certain particles compared to others. Okay, so a few key strengths of common of particle filtering before we get into to the first layer of understanding it. It has loose distributional assumptions. Um, again, no dependence on normality, no reliance on the linearization. You can still derive much value even if the, each data point is very ambiguous. Um, you can have diverse types of observations. You can have that in common filtering as well. And it's really highly suited, as is common filtering to high velocity data. Social media data, search data, data on cases, wastewater data, hospital data coming out every day, what have you. Very, very uh, good uh, match to, to what you have here. And finally, if you formulate a particle filtering algorithm, you could kind of, um, uh, upgrade it to or, or uh, upscale it to be used in a particle MCMC algorithm. Um, okay, we, we talked about this basic idea we're incorporating information from a wide variety of, of different, uh, different data sources and, and then we can project forward. Um, now, uh, particle filtering um, will uh, take us uh, to particle MCMC. Particle filtering will be a component of particle MCMC, but particle MCMC will be sampling from the per static parameter values as well. Here, we're treating them as, as constant, the static values. We're sampling from a joint distribution of the current state and the state um, through past time. So imagine that we have something like this COVID-19 dynamic model. Um, so here we have uh, susceptibles, we have some vaccinated protection, but vaccination is in, offers incomplete protection, incomplete um, uh, effectiveness. People can get infected. This is a latent state where people are infected, but not yet infective. This is pre-symptomatic. And they can continue on in a, in a post-C or a asymptomatic form, or they can continue on in a frankly symptomatic form, early stage infection, with symptoms, late stage infections. And when people progress on, they either develop very severe infection, which could bring them to the hospital, either to the ICU, to the non-ICU or to the ICU, or they could uh, most commonly just go on to, to just uh, continue to have fairly mild symptoms and recover. Um, there's a distinction here also made between uh, diagnosed and undiagnosed so that we could compare the number being diagnosed in the model with the number being um, in reported cases. Um, so we have in this model, an explicit set of diagnosis transitions, reflecting the fact that it's people with symptoms that are predominantly diagnosed because they're the ones walking into clinics, but active case finding like mass testing or like contact tracing can find people who are asymptomatic. 
Um, and so a system like this has underlying ODEs. I think you know this crowd, you're, you're comfortable with it. I want to talk about how this sort of model fits in with particle filtering. Okay, so these are a couple of key facts. These are absolutely central to understand. First of all, the simulation model has to have stochastics in it. There have to be stochastics governing this. Okay, these are showing the non-stochastic components, but in general, you will have stochastics. Those stochastics may govern the evolution of certain parameters that are changing over time, like about people's likelihood of willingness to get tested or, or something about their contact rates. Um, but it also might involve some stochastics associated with you know, diagnosis or, or sorry, with uh, progression, the number going to asymptomatic versus symptomatic pathways. It needs to be stochastic, just like with common filtering. It doesn't make sense to use these techniques, except if you have a stochastic process. If you don't have a stochastic process, you could do something like MCMC and estimate parameters and the values of the parameters together with the initial state will tell you what the state of the system is now. Um, no fuss, no muss. There's no state to estimate other than knowing the parameter values that tells you all you need to know to project forward from current state and tell you the underlying state. What we're dealing with here is estimating the underlying state of the system here in common filtering. And we only do that with a stochastic process. Okay, now beyond uh, that, um, as with common filtering, um, we have two phases of operation. You may remember with common filtering, we went back and forth between two phases, system evolution between measurements, going back and forth with state updates. We actually had a little diagram that showed this, right? We have time updates and then measurement updates. Time updates, it's just simulating the system forward. Measurement update, it's correcting. This was the time update just simulating it forward. This is the measurement update where it's correcting it. In the event you're projecting forward into the future, um, you're only gonna be doing time updates. There's no measurement update to be had. You're just running it forward with these equations. Um, that was Coleman filtering. Particle filtering has a mirror of that. It, it's very much like that. In particle filtering, we're running the the system, actually many versions of the system, um, each competing hypotheses representing by what we call particles, we're running them forward. Um, we call it the prediction step or, or the time update step. Um, we just run it forward to the next observation point or, or arbitrarily forward if we're in the future, if we're characterizing the future. Um, so no, most commonly with what's called the condensation algorithm, there's no fancy stuff going on there. We're just running our stochastic ODEs. Great. The entire state here though, at observation points is going to be corrected. And I use those words in quotes to align the empirical data with the observation. But as I said earlier, there's a difference here. Um, common filtering or Estimating our, we're updating our, our understanding of the state. You know, we had an understanding of the state and we are updating it. We are correcting it, right? And that's what, that's what this is. We're correcting it. This was our old estimate and we're nudging it by a factor associated with the gain matrix to get a new update. Okay, a new estimate. Okay, well, uh, with particle filtering, that's, very, it's very different. We're not doing that. What are we doing? What we're doing is we are instead updating which hype interpretations we trust. So what we're going to have here is many competing hypotheses for what's going on in the system. Each of these hypotheses will have a complete state of the system that it believes it's in. So you might have one hypothesis saying, I think there's a lot of susceptibles, a, a small but notable number of exposed, a, a lot of pre-symptomatic folks, and very few folks who are symptomatic or recovered. 
another particle might say, no, you're all wet. You know, there's, um, uh, there's a moderate number of susceptibles. There's a lot of people recovered now and quite a few uh, symptomatic individuals, quite a few uh, asymptomatic. And there'll be many of these particles. These particles have different, these are each called a particle. They each have a hypothesis about the, cur about the situation of the systems in at any one point. So if you're at a certain time, each particle has a certain belief about the system. Each is associated at a technical level with a state vector. That is, each says, I believe the state of the system right now is characterized by this state vector, where the elements of the state vector are S, V1, V2, EU, IAU, et cetera. Each has a full belief about this is the state of the system now, Another particle will say, no, this is the state now. They are each competing hypotheses. Um, and what's going to happen is that each of those hypotheses believes hard. It's not going to change its mind. It's never going to change its mind about what the state is right now. When we see new data, it's not going to change its mind. It believes that is the situation. What's going to change is how much credibility we put into one of those versus others. Um, and we'll get to this uh, in just a second. Um, what's going to happen is when new data comes in, rather than re-estimate the state from the beginning till now, we're just going to update it based on new data or the most recent window of, of data. Um, and uh, this will update our earlier particle weights to new particle weights. Um, those weights reflect our the, the, the credibility we associate with the particle, how much we believe this particle compared to that one. So each sample here, each hypothesis, we have these jockeying hypotheses, each trying to explain the underlying situation. They're each represented by a particle. Each has a complete hypothesis about the state, a complete state vector um, for the situation right now. And each is associated with a weight they're not all equal. Their weight indicates our level of credibility for them. If, if we have a particle with a weight, a hypothesis with a weight of two compared to another one with a weight of one, it means the, the one with a weight of two is twice as common in the distribution as the one with a weight of one. In other words, the weight tells us how frequent that is in our distribution of, of possible values of the underlying state. Remember, we're we're trying to, under, trying to estimate a state distribution. What state is the system in right now? And you know, there's different possible states it could be in. It's a joint distribution. So um, we, we're, we're trying to understand jointly what, what, what state it's in across all these different state variables. And if we have a particle with a weight of two um, uh, versus one with a weight of, versus another with a weight of one, that means the one with the weight of two is twice as highly represented in that distribution. We encounter it twice as often as the other one. Um, so each of these sample, each of these particles is this hypothesis. They have a complete hypothesis about the state and they're, they're all competing to explain the situation. What is it that will allow them to flourish? What will lead their weight to grow? Well, if they're better at explaining the situation. So the more consistent they are with the observations, the more consistent this particle's beliefs are with what's actually seen, the more their weight will rise, the more credibility they'll be given, the more, the more uh, they'll be uh, accorded uh, belief. Um, those that are not consistent with the data, that consi uh, consistently whiff and, and miss the data, you know, predict things that are not in line with the data, those will have their weights decreased over time. And guess what? There's a survival of the fittest. Those that have high weights will be fruitful and multiply. Those that with low weights will tend to die out. They'll tend to be replaced by ones that are more, that are more plausible. So at, at any time, each particle has a certain value of the state vector. Each particle has a certain belief about the current situation and believes hard. It's not changing its mind. Um, now, how consistent that will be will, will vary. As you can imagine, 
if right now what we're seeing in the empirical data is lots of cases coming in, a particle which, which says, look, you know, the, the outbreak has passed, everyone has recovered, there's a few susceptibles and no one's infected anymore. That sort of particle will give a, uh, an expectation. It would, it would be very unlikely, it would say you're very unlikely to see lots of cases. And if we see that there are a lot of cases, that's a low likelihood event for that particle, its weight is gonna be downgraded. We're gonna believe it less. We're gonna believe that that's impossible. By contrast, if there's a particle that said, yeah, there's a lot of people in these states still um, that, that would be, uh, have its weight um, uh, still uh, maintained or, or boosted even. Okay, so, so these are some basic facts about how particle filtering works. We have these competing hypotheses for what's going on. Think of the model as a bunch of layers coming out of this screen at you. Imagine this uh, bunch of layers coming out, hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of layers, each associated with a particle, each associated with a different hypothesis. Remember, it's evolving stochastically. So these particles, even if they agree right now, they'll start to diverge. But each one is a certain belief right now, at this time, say time, you know, 102, about day 102, about how many people are in each of these states. Each particle has a certain belief, says a certain number here, a certain number here, a certain number here. And we're going to be, um, uh, we're going to be running that out over time. So how do we perform it? Well, we take that model, we subscript it by particle. That's those layers I was talking about, these layers coming out. It's subscripted by particle. And each particle has its own full copy of model state. Um, and the basic gist of it is that we're going to start with a state distribution from a, some prior distribution. And then between observations of the world, um, between observations, when we're, we don't have a new observation to continue, uh, to, to consider, all these particles are going to evolve across their layers, right? We have all these layers coming out of the screen at us and they're all going to run independently. There's no crosstalk between them. They just all run according to the standard model dynamics. It's a stochastic ODE. It's just performing integration of each particle state until the next observation point. They're all just running in parallel. All the particles survive. Their weights remain unchanged. And this is what's called the condensation algorithm, which is the simplest version of particle filtering and the, the, by far the most common. They're all just running out according to standard ODEs. This has a direct analog with Kalman filtering where it, between observations, we just ran it according to the governing, the governing uh, rules of, of, the, of the ODE. Uh, this is, these are the governing equations of the ODE. We just ran it out. So it is with Kalman filter or with particle filtering. We're just running it out over, over time. Okay. Um, uh, now that's the time update phase of the prediction phase. The, the measurement update phase, that's where there's a lot of splaining to do. That's where there's a lot of, of accounting to do. That's where, there's, that's where a lot of action happens. And it was just like that, right, for common filtering. At the, at the measurement update, we had some we, we got a better sense of what the underlying situation is. And so it is here. Um, but it's not because any particle changes its mind. It's because we get more savvy about which particles are plausible and which are not. So at an observation point, um, say daily, as new data comes in, maybe it's cases and hospitalizations and deaths and you know, any number of different things. For each particle, for each of those layers, we're going to multiply its weight. Remember, the weight reflects its credibility. We're going to multiply it by something that's going to tell us how credibly did this particle behave. And specifically, we're going to multiply the weight, the pre-existing weight, by the likelihood that given that particle state, that particle's belief as to what is the case right now, what's the likelihood we will have observed this latest data? 
that we observed. Um, um, so each particle has a state right now that says how many people are in each of these compartments. And, and that state would tell you um, how many people you expect to see reported as cases flowing down these flows. How many you expect to see hospitalized? How many you expect to see die? How many you expect to see, how much uh, virus do you expect to see in wastewater? Um, uh, how many people do you expect overnight in the hospitals? Uh, in short, each particle um, has a certain expectation given its, its, its posited state, the state that it thinks obtains right now. It, it has a certain expectation of what it should see. And, and that's captured in the likelihood function. Um, so the likelihood we ask, given that particle state, what's the likelihood you would have observed that the particle, uh, given the particle's beliefs that you would have observed this empirical observation that was actually obtained with, you know, a moderate, uh, very few deaths, moderate number of hospitalizations, lots of cases and moderate love amount of wastewater um, uh, uh, representation of the virus. Um, uh, if, if that likelihood is high, the particle weight will be, might even grow, might multiply by something greater than one. Um, by contrast, if that likelihood is really small, if this is a particle that says, ah, everyone's recovered and they're all recovered and susceptible and there's no one else, and it's totally at variance, we might see a likelihood that's very, very small. We multiply the weight of the particle by it and particle weight becomes really, really smaller yet. And the more and more it, you know, misjudges the situation that it predicts, predicts something, that particle predicts something that's just not in line with what's observed, its weight will get, a, will get smaller and smaller. But then there's this process of what's called resampling, okay? Um, and I had a better version of this, um, not sure where it was, but um, this resampling. And this is survival, of, uh, sort of where the survival of the fittest comes in. With resampling, what's going to happen is um, when our effective sample size is too small, when we're carrying around a lot of these particles that have weights that are tiny, the particles predictions are for the birds. They, they have tunnel, tiny weights. Um, we're going to say, oh, come on, we can do better than that. We're going to sort of reallocate our space involved um, for particles. We're going to let ones that have been highly predictive multiply. They're fruitful and multiply. We clone these particles into many copies of it. Um, uh, so, so those particles, suddenly many layers will come about from, from them that, that share their characteristics, their beliefs. Um, the ones that have moderate weight will probably, many of them will scrape by, et cetera. But the ones with really low weight, they'll tend to die out. Um, they'll tend to disappear. Um, now, you may be confused by this. Like, why would we clone a particle state? Isn't that just going to lead to, you know, uh, particles which are all exactly the same? Well, remember, this is a stochastic model. So they may, st they may start after that, uh, you know, with the same beliefs, but about what the underlying state is, but then they're going to diverge because of the stochastics. It's going to knock them about. Um, uh, okay, so um, uh, right. Um, so I'm, I'm watching the time, and we may have to uh, go into this uh, more. Yeah, we'll have to uh, explain this more. But the idea is uh, next time um, with with some particular examples. But the idea is that you know each particle has a has a state. Um, we're going to have some things that are dynamically evolving over time, and we're going to have likelihood functions, which are going to tell us for a given particle state, a state of a given particle, what's the likelihood of observing, you know, endogenous cases, um, ICU admissions, or ICU census, the overnight number of people in the ICU or in the non-ICU, viral load concentrations. And we will get that overall likelihood, maybe a product of sub likelihoods, and use that to update the weights of the particles. Um, so uh, that will update these weights. It will downplay the ones that are less credible. It will upplay the ones that are more credible. We'll have one of these survival of the fittest moments periodically where we have a um, 
you know, a judgment day and the ones that are that are more credible get multiplied. And it will tend to lead to a system which is following the data. And that's exactly what happens here. And this is exactly how these graphs were produced via a particle filter with measles or with pertussis or what have you. Um, so over here, the, the particles in the model that were consistent with the data were favored. Those that predicted no outbreak here, we would die off. Those that predicted no outbreak here would die off. Those that predicted a continuing outbreak here would tend to die off. And so it kind of accords with that. We track the state. And then as our data runs out and we have to project forward, we just run the particles forward with no updates to their weights. Here, it's very important to realize it does not make sense to talk about the particles without their weights. As we'll see, particles are formulated with weights according to the principles of importance sampling. The, the weight represents the level of um, frequency of that particle within the distribution. So whenever we draw from the, from the particles, we, we do so with a chance of drawing each according to its weight. And what this allows us is a model whose underlying state tracks the state of the system very closely. It, it tracks what's actually happened over time in contrast to this sort of situation where the model is increasingly disconnected from what's observed. Here it follows quite precisely what's observed, but it's always ready in light of, of its estimate of the underlying situation, always consistent with what the model says is possible, always consistent with the theory um, its interpretation of the world. And then you can run it forward and ask what's likely to happen over the next little bit. And it can engage in outbreak prediction. It can engage in anticipation of what's likely to play out over coming weeks or whether your ICU is likely to be overrun or your hospital is likely to fill up um, uh, or be deluged with, with new arrivals. Um, okay, so that's... Um, a lot of the gist here of particle filtering at the very highest level. We're going to be doing a deep dive on particle filtering. And in order to understand it, uh, I will need to ask, to help you understand it, I will need to ask for your patience because we're gonna go into it at basically four different levels. Number one, intuition. That's what I've been emphasizing today. Number two, we're gonna be going into it a little bit at the philosophical level. I've kind of emphasized that. We want to interpret things from the world in a way that's consistent with our theory. We have a theory about how COVID-19 develops and spreads. And when we look at data from the world, we want to look at it through the lens of that theory and, and thereby make sense of all these different lines of evidence in a way that's consistent with that theory. That's kind of second level. But the two final levels are the tough ones, I think, uh, especially tough ones for students. The first is the level of probability distributions. There's underneath this, there's a sampling in terms of probability distributions. And this audience, um, I, if, if any audience can get it, you folks can. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about the underlying probability theory that underlies this, which it turns out is very beautiful. Um, and we'll see prior distributions and posterior distributions and likelihoods and how it all fits together. Why it is we update, we multiply the, the weight of a particle by a likelihood, for example, to get a new weight in the condensation algorithm. And that would be nice. Um, um, and that should help you understand why this all works so well with dynamic models. Um, but there's a level below that either, either, which is very prominent in the implementation of it. And you want to know that so you can implement it. And you want to know it so you can look at what's going on in the implementations. And that has to do with important sampling. We have these probability distributions, but then we want to sample from them in practice. We want to run this on an honest to goodness 
algorithm on a, on a computer. Um, and we want to sample it, um, and and we're going to be um, we're going to be seeing how the, pro, the the principles of sequential importance sampling um, play a role there. We saw some of this um, hints of this with rejection sampling with approximate Bayesian computation, but as we'll see, it's much more sophisticated with with uh, uh, with uh, particle filtering. Um, I guess I should say there's a fifth, uh, a fifth level too. Applying particle filtering in practice in, in the context of real world data, models, uncertainties uh, that confront us involves tuning the system. We have to tune it to behave well. We have to, we don't want it to be overconfident. We don't want it to be have no self-efficacy and just roll belly up and say, I have no idea what's going on. We want it to, to have that good balance between, you know, um, some degree of confidence, but some humility to recognize when it's wrong. And that requires tuning it, tuning the particle filtering. And, the, and there's uh, a science and an art to that. Um, and uh, RTA is a master. Uh, at that. Um, uh, and uh, it turns out that there's some basic rules of thumb that can help you get very far in that process. So I'll be talking about those, those practical aspects of this. So this is going to occupy us for a couple lectures. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to go on and see how all this fits into PMCMC, which will take it to another level yet but where all of this fits directly into PMCMC. It uses all of these mechanisms. It uses particle filtering and MCMC's key components. So, um, so that's where we're going. Now, I do have one final announcement I just want to draw to your attention. Um, so uh, uh, next week, we're meeting twice, um, Monday and Friday as normal. On Friday, I'm giving a talk um, for the Mathematics for Public Health agent-based modeling group on a talk on a topic directly relevant to this uh, course. Uh, that group is unfortunately rather inflexible about the timing of it. Um, and uh, we actually ended up moving it to next week from an earlier time to prevent a total conflict with this course. But my talk next week, will be going for them um, from uh, basically it'll, it'll cut into the first half hour of this course. So my, my time, it will go 10 to 11, where this course begins my time at 1030. Um, you can do the translation into your time. Uh, but this is, this is with regret because it's going to cut short us to an hour next Friday. But I'll be here. I'll, we'll meet and I'll go out of that talk and right into this course. But I think actually many of you will be interested in it. And I just want to put this on your radar. I'll announce it on the site. So I'm going to be talking there about the confluence of big data with agent-based modeling, and specifically the use of micro-contact data, such as collected via smartphones, for, for uh, agent-based modeling. And in fact, we've used it with common filtering and particle filtering as well. Um, but there I'm going to be looking at, at uh, the utility of it. And um, the talk is, is entitled, is it a, a, you know, a luxury or necessity, the role of microcontact data in, um, in infectious transmission studies? And uh, I'm thinking a lot of people in this course might be interested because it's taking big data, using it together with models, and in some cases, finding it essential for models. So uh, I will be posting the links to that. You're not required to come, but just bear in mind that I will be a half hour late to this class. So next Friday, a week from today, this class will begin a half hour later than it normally does because I'll be delivering this lecture to the very end of that time and then switching over here. I hope many of you may come to that lecture. Um, you can join it. Uh, there's no restriction. And I'd welcome attendance and questions from you on that. Um, 
But um, anyway, I should warn you about that. Those who are not available or not interested in that, just set your set your calendars to have this this course go from a half hour later than it normally starts on your calendar for next Friday. Um, okay, um, that's all for today. Um, uh, I do uh, I do see. Um, yeah, are the particle states static or dynamic? This is a question from Maurice here. I will say the particle states evolve over time. They evolve according to the differential equations, the stochastic differential equations. At any one time, a particle believes one thing. It's a certain state vector. Believes right now, there's a certain number of people in the susceptible state, a certain number in the effective, a certain number of the recovered. A given particle at one time believes a certain, a sub, uh, its beliefs can be summarized in a parameter vector. Over time, it's going to be evolving um, as governed by the rules of the system. Um, and it's and unlike in Kalman filtering, that particle is never going to change its mind due to data. It'll just be viewed as more credible or less credible according to that data. Um, OK, thanks very much. Great. Um, I will be here for office hours shortly. I'm just going to take a health break and I'll be right back within uh, five or 10 minutes here. Thanks very much.